Historically, doctors didn't really think much about food. And we thought about antibiotics for knocking out bacteria. We wanted antiviral drugs to knock out viruses. And nutrition is looked down upon in medical education. It's, the, it's not even the poor sister, it's the poor second cousin. Real doctors were in the emergency rooms, stitching up wounds and delivering babies and fixing broken arms. Nutrition, boring stuff. Send them to the dietitian, let her figure out a diet for her. Don't bother me, I'm doing real medicine. Uh, a, a very unfortunate uh, oversight, to say the least. But I'm happy to tell you that a great many doctors are now paying attention to nutrition and are talking about particularly plant-based diets because we now know that we can not just prevent illness. In many cases, we can reverse it. We can have narrowed arteries open up again. We can have diabetes improve and sometimes even go away. And that is possible not with drugs, but with food. It's the food, it's the food, it's the food. We need to evolve uh, to a plant-based diet, whole food, plant-based diet, whole food, unprocessed, plant-based diet. And watch the miracles happen. Marshall, Texas. Cattle country. Population 23,933. Plus one mayor and his wife who decided to tackle the greatest threat to life its residents had ever faced, their diet. By the time I was 18 years old, I was one of the top-ranked high school swimmers in the country. Even as a college athlete, I battled high cholesterol. When that chapter was over, that was really kind of it uh, for me in terms of being an athlete. I came from the suppre suppression side, which is the active side of putting out fires, to the administrative side, where it's more paperwork and more office and sit-down work. I started to have health problems because for many, many years, for decades, I'd been living on what a friend of mine calls the window diet. A whole regime was stopping at a burger place on one day, a pizza place on the next day, and so on and so forth. Very unhealthy diet. And the window diet is if you can pull your car up and they roll down a window and they hand it to you through the window, then you eat it. I had never eaten an orange. I was 28 years old, had never eaten an orange. I drank probably a thousand gallons of orange juice. Well, from around here, basically, you're told that as, as you get older, you're just going to gain a little weight. I just started to justify, well, this is just what I'm going to weigh now. I'm going to weigh 200 pounds. Everyone looks at that as natural around here. By the time I was 39, it, it really caught up to me. I was about 50 pounds overweight. I was like, well, I don't know. Who cares? Everybody else is overweight. I'm just one more overweight guy. But more important than the weight was really my energy levels. I just I felt terrible all the time. I was depressed. I was lethargic. I was unenthusiastic about my life. I had gone to my doctor and I had some issues, but he asked me what my biggest issue was. Uh, and I said it was my memory. I was having trouble remembering things. So my joints started to hurt. I felt sluggish. Then the years went by and another five pounds. I couldn't get it off though. I would try to go run. I felt like my legs didn't want to work right. My lungs certainly didn't want to work right. And I was making my way up this staircase right here to go to sleep and had to pause halfway up a simple flight of stairs. I was winded, I was out of breath, sweat on my brow, uh, tightness in my chest buckled over, and I thought, what is going on? You know, I'm 39 years old, I should be in perfect health, and I feel like I'm about to have a heart attack. A lot of my pilot friends have all had these lower discs in their back um, herniate. They end up having to get surgery. It's a very expensive surgery. It puts them out of work for weeks. They're laid up in bed. And it just so happens I was starting to develop signs of that. And so without even knowing it or without even realizing it, I'm 250 pounds now. I'm 250 pounds and my radar goes off suddenly, suddenly, I'm diabetic. And the physician came back with the results and said, oh, your cholesterol is over 200. And I was running at a collegiate level. And my neurologist told me that I was, well, I was overweight. Uh, you know, uh, 
My blood pressure was high. She said I was going to be diabetic. It's sometimes surprising how fit you can be and still have so much plaque buildup running through your veins. I had shooting pains down my leg occasionally. Um, I, I would always blame it. I was sitting weird. I was going to have a heart attack. And I, if I lived past all that, you know, my memory would leave me. But I was desperate and I really wanted to figure out a way to feel good. I wanted to find a way to have high energy levels and be able to enjoy my children at their energy level. I was like, I've got to do something, you know. And so one day Ed Smith came, our mayor. I'd known Ed and Amanda Smith for two, three years now at that point. I thought that they were just animal lovers. At that point, Ed and Amanda is getting ready to have what they call an immersion, where they were going to bring several different doctors and, and specialists and people that were of the same mindset to Marshall. There was this health event in Marshall called Get Healthy Marshall. And having the background that I had, I didn't feel like I needed to go. I felt like, oh, I have a master's degree. I have a background in nutrition. Um, I know this material. Ed and Amanda Smith asked me to, to fly their airplane down to Austin, Texas, and it just so happened they had an extra ch ticket to hear some doctor. I wasn't going to go until my husband asked me to go. And because he happened to be friends with Ed Smith. Normally I would have found some excuse to not go and hear a doctor talk about health. But, but I said, well, I'll take, take advantage of the opportunity that's in front of me. It was a round trip that would change their lives forever. Well, I'm Ed Smith, and I was uh, first elected mayor in 2000, and I served uh, as mayor of the city of Marshall from 2000 to 2008, and I decided not to seek re-election at that time, and uh, then later in uh, 2012, I had some people talk me into running again, and so uh, I was re-elected uh, to our city commission, and I've served as our mayor since uh, 2012 now to present, so I'm in my sixth overall term. So I grew up in, in cattle country and in a family that was oriented toward the, the cattle business and uh, beef was the staple of our diet growing up. A few years ago, around 2006, I kind of became faced with my own mortality from the standpoint that uh, some of the, my friends that I went to school with, uh, a, a gentleman in the neighboring city, Longview, he went to college with me as an attorney over there. Uh, I thought he was healthy and fit and uh, he, uh, he certainly wasn't overweight. He jogged every day, and one morning while he was out jogging, he just dropped dead of a heart attack. In 2008, we got married. Uh, that was also the year that his um, prostate cancer was diagnosed. I happened to have my PSA score taken about that time, and it was elevated in excess of four. And four is the cutoff uh, that we use in this country and probably uh, worldwide uh, as the uh, a determining factor of whether you have prostate cancer or not, or one of the determining factors. The doctor was very cavalier. He wanted to do a biopsy Thursday and operate on Monday, not, without even knowing the results of the biopsy. So we uh, decided to do some research and we scoured the internet. I went to a urologist, uh, a gentleman in Florida, and uh, who um, a, a, had a way of approaching uh, treating prostate cancer with a, uh, a whole foods plant-based diet approach. We made sure that we went back to foods that were close to nature. After being diagnosed with prostate cancer, Ed opted to forego chemotherapy and surgery, choosing instead to change his diet to a whole food plant-based one. To make things simple, I encourage people to eat from four healthy food groups, vegetables and fruits, whole grains and legumes or beans. Those are the healthy food groups. Now that might mean a big bowl of porridge for breakfast or perhaps some blueberry pancakes. And for lunch, I could have a vegetable stew or a bean burrito or I could have my spaghetti or other pasta covered with artichoke hearts and mushrooms and chunky tomatoes and peppers, or whatever I want. But meat, you're better off without it. Same with the other animal products. We followed that for uh, uh, monthly, my PSA scores after that. and. Uh, uh, my PSA scores began coming down and uh, so much so that uh, they got down to the level of one and uh, 
you know, for over a year, about 18 months, we, we took a monthly reading, and then we went to about a quarterly reading, and then now every, about every six months I do my PSA score, and so far my PSA has stayed down around round one, and uh, I've since done, you know, additional MRI work, and uh, there's no evidence of any progression, and it, it seems that even may, uh, maybe there's been a regression in the uh, um, evidence of uh, prostate cancer. In the Ed found that with simple changes to his diet, moving away from his Texas meat-eating roots, he was able to enjoy much better personal health. Prostate cancer is very, very common. The older men get, the higher the risk of it developing. And researchers have tried to find out why. And one of the biggest culprits seems to be milk, milk and other dairy products. When researchers at Harvard brought in a group of almost 21,000 physicians, those who drank the most milk had 30% higher risk of developing prostate cancer compared to the men who avoided dairy products. They repeated the study with a larger sample, almost 48,000 health professionals, and those who drank milk had about a 60% higher risk of getting prostate cancer compared to the men who avoided milk. Why? Why would milk have anything to do with prostate cancer? Well, there are two possible reasons. One is that milk increases the level of what's called IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor in your blood that stimulates the growth of cancer cells. I came from a background of being on the farm, and so I was milking cows. I, I thought at the beginning of my career, this is a good idea, like everyone else thinks. The more, the better. But in reality, in the research that we were doing over the years, a lot of experimental research, and published in the very best journals, one of the things that, one of the main messages that we got early on in my career was that the protein of dairy is not good. This is a powerful growth promoting hormone or substance and uh, you, you add lots of IGF-1 to the body. If you've got a little cancer growing in your breast or your prostate or your colon, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. The other is that all of that milk is contributing too much calcium and that calcium tends to shut down the vitamin D in the body which can protect against prostate cancer. So if you have too much milk, it defeats all of those protections. There's nothing healthy or certainly nothing required about the milk of a cow. We have no more need for the milk of a cow than we need the milk of a giraffe. Having witnessed the immediate and startling benefits of his new diet, Ed and Amanda decided they wanted to share this knowledge with the wider Marshall community. So after talking to them, like I said, it only made sense to go on this, this type of diet. When I thought I'd done everything and still wasn't seeing results, I decided, well, let me try this plant-based diet thing. With whatever limited knowledge that I had, I started that day. Firefighters are always good at challenging one, of, one another. I had issues, diabetes. My chief had issues, cholesterol. And we have another firefighter, our EMS training officer, who also decided, you know what? This makes sense. Well, after 30 days, I'd lost roughly 35 pounds. You know, I, I lost quite a bit of weight doing vegetarian. And uh, then when I started this, it just started coming off. It. I mean, my body just started transforming. Everything got better. One of the areas that we've been very concerned about recently is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease attacks almost half of us by age 85, and it can start much earlier than that. And researchers have found that one of the biggest contributors to it seems to be what I'm going to call bad fat, saturated fat. The more of this bad fat that people eat, the higher their risk. It can be increased by as much as 300% above the levels that pe uh, of people who have very little bad fat. Their risk of Alzheimer's is that much higher. So where is that bad fat coming from? The number one source is dairy. Dairy products are the biggest contributor to all that bad fat. In those 28 days, and then put it like this, Bob Cole was kind of a jogging runner. I was do walking and my chief wasn't doing any exercise. All three of us in those 28 days lost an average of about 17 pounds. With diabetes, we have turned the page. 20 years ago, everyone thought that diabetes was caused by eating sugar. Well, we now know that diabetes, I'm speaking of type 2 diabetes, the common form that, that occurs in adulthood typically. It's caused by the buildup of tiny amounts of fat, little particles of fat inside the muscle cells or also perhaps the liver cells of the body. And as fat gets, builds up inside the cell, it means insulin can no longer work. 
It's like chewing gum in a lock. Well, if there is fat building up inside the cell, the insulin key can no longer open that cell to allow the glucose inside. So that buildup of fat seems to be the cause of type 2 diabetes. Many of my patients will come and, you know, basically they say, well, doc, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm eating in moderation. I'm, I'm eating lots of greens. And early on when I started counseling patients on eating fruits and vegetables, uh, I was actually tricked. I mean, patients are very savvy people. So I said, well, okay, I want you to eat a lot of salad, this, that, and the other. I want you to eat greens and fruit, and I want you to, you know, lightly steam it, etc. Uh, you can have beans and so on. And so they come back and, and they say, well, I'm exercising more and I'm eating more fruits and vegetables, etc. But they didn't remove the bad food. They didn't remove the steak or the hamburger every now and then. So in essence, um, it, it's, it's like uh, opening up your, your, your bank. And so you hire five nuns and two thieves. And after the first couple of weeks, all of your drawers come up short. And then you say, look, we need more integrity in this bank. So you hire five more nuns. So you have 10 nuns and two thieves. And then after a few more weeks, all of your drawers still come up short. And you say to yourself, hmm, I need more integrity in this bank. So I'm gonna hire five more nuns. So you have 15 nuns and two thieves. Your drawers will still come up short because you have to remove the thieves. And the thieves in our diet are the animal protein, the processed carbohydrates, and these are the foods that we leave them in our diet to a small extent, especially if you have chronic illnesses. These chronic illnesses will not go away. And now I've been eating this way for over two and a half years, and um, I'm doing great. And I actually did the cholesterol test, and um, my cholesterol numbers were 114. Well, Six months after I'd made the change, my back healed itself. I haven't had, I don't know if it was the culmination of the weight loss, the overall just my joints and all of my uh, internal systems just operating at a much higher level, but I don't have any back issues. I haven't felt a sharp pain for months in my legs. I returned to a fitness regimen not because I had any desire to become a competitive athlete again. I just had so much energy, I literally couldn't sit still. I was bouncing off the walls, I was vibrating with all of this energy and I said, I gotta go out and do something to burn off all this energy so I can sit down and focus and do my work. I think my relationship with my wife and my kids got better. It's kind of weird how everything just seemed to just, I've, I've had no negative effects. I haven't been sick in over a year and a half. No stomach problems, no, uh, no chest pains, no reflux, nothing. As you know, it's just, Every day is just a good day. <laughs> Having been given a second chance, Ed and Amanda decided they wanted to make every day a good day for the citizens of Marshall. They designed a program to take that message to a wider audience. I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service. That's the service that deals with people's hearts and uh, blood vessels. And day after day, I was putting people to sleep and watching surgeons open their chests and uh, pulling out this yellow, greasy material from their artery walls called atherosclerosis. After a while, I began looking at this material and I, because I spent a lot of my time growing up on a farm, I looked and I said, you know, that stuff they're pulling out of the arteries looks like chicken fat. And the little voice on my shoulder said, there's a good reason why it looks like chicken fat. It is chicken fat, and cow fat, and pig fat, and the fat of all the animals this man has been eating all his life and started accumulating inside the artery walls. And that said something very profound to me. The number one killer, heart disease, is something that I am convinced we could almost completely obliterate if people would get the animal products off of their plate. Because what happens is your cholesterol falls dramatically when you do that. And researchers have found that if you get your cholesterol below about 150, diet is the beginning of that. For some people, maybe one in 10, they may need medication to help them over that last little bit. But the heart disease is just gone. But this is a total body disease. The, that plaque that's in their coronary arteries is in the arteries to their brain, to their kidneys, to their legs. It's all over. And just pulling a little bit out of the heart arteries may save their lives acutely. But if they continue eating their current diet that put them on the operating table in the first place, they're going to be right back in, on the table. And indeed, that's what has proven to be. We saw the changes in my life, personally. Uh, we saw the changes in my wife's life when she changed to this diet and her personal health. And then we... Uh, 
uh, we'd seen what was going on around the country with some of these various uh, physicians and uh, clinicians around the country and what was going on in their clinical practice and the results they were getting. And we thought, well, let's, let's bring that to a community, to a city, and could we reintroduce a program here in our community to see if we could bring change to people's health. Being at that time a former mayor and now mayor again, uh, it's something that uh, I feel like I have an obligation to, uh, to spread this word out because I have uh, something that uh, can change people's lives that I know about that people need. Many people don't recognize they need it, but they need to know. They need to at least be exposed to it and, and have an opportunity to uh, make an informed decision about their, their future and their health. To turn an entire community of carnivores into plant eaters overnight wasn't going to be easy. This was the home of the cowboy, but Ed had a plan. Being here in Texas, where we're in the heart of cattle country here, and uh, yeah, we had a lot of resistance, a lot of skepticism, a lot of raised eyebrows, uh, a lot of people thought we were crazy, uh, maybe from Mars, you know, people were wondering, you know, what happened to me, what, you know, if I lost my mind. We finally decided everyone in our community thinks we're crazy and they're not going to listen to us. So if we can't convince them, we'll bring the experts in. Well, the first event we did was an Engine 2 immersion. It was so successful, we thought we'd get maybe 50 people and 200 people came. So we decided to do the New Year New You Health Fest six months later because January is a very slow time in Marshall. The businesses are slow. We thought we could get the best speakers in the world and downtown would come alive with people learning how to be healthier and it would be good for the community and be good for the individual people who attended. So we wanted speakers that would never come to this area to be accessible to the people here. Ed and Amanda's plan was taking off, but they still had to convince the cream of the health crop that Marshall was a town worth saving. We're going to kidnap Chef AJ from this festival and bring her back to Marshall so she can do some talks and um, demos for people at the potluck tomorrow. So we're really excited about that. Once at the festival, Ed and Amanda quickly got to work, convincing the best health speakers in the world to come to a little town in the northeast of Texas to share their knowledge, to work their magic, to save lives. Hi, I'm Chef AJ. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I was originally born in Chicago, and I've been following a plant-based diet for over 37 years. And I'm excited to be here in Marshall, Texas for the fourth time that I've been invited by Mayor Ed Smith and his lovely wife, Amanda, to do one of their wonderful programs. And I remember the first potluck, there was, you know, a few people. Every year it gets bigger, and people came in last night for the potluck, for a potluck. They drove from Oklahoma. They drove from Louisiana. So. The message is getting out there and, and people seem to really be hungry, no pun intended, for this knowledge. We try to do potlucks every month. We usually do about 10 months a year because we travel a lot, so sometimes we're not available to do one. But we do at least 10 a year. And during the potluck, if it's someone's first time, we don't ask them to bring anything. We tell them just to come and, and there's always more than enough food uh, so they can see what it's like in case they're nervous. We all sit and visit and eat and then we show a video, usually um, a lecture by one of the experts. You can find a lot of these online and we get videotapes from uh, VegSource where they do the Healthy Lifestyle Expo every year and they videotape the entire expo and so we show those lectures a lot. But we try to mix it up and alternate the topics and so forth. So people come, they gather, they get that social aspect, they get to be inspired by other people's success stories, they get to eat great food and then they get to learn something when they watch the lecture. Ed and Amanda's interactive approach was proving to be a big hit with the locals. Slowly the people of Marshall were coming around to a new way of thinking about their diet. But the thing is that saying about everything in moderation, a little bit won't hurt, well a little bit does hurt and moderation kills because what happens is even a little bit of these foods is making most of America fat and sick. So what happens is you become addicted. You get stuck in what's called the pleasure trap and that's where most Americans are because most Americans are addicted to sugar, fat, and salt. I had migraines up until I became the vegan and I cut out uh, all dairy products and my migraines stopped immediately and I haven't had one since. I guess my daughter told me something about the mayor here in town was vegan and I said that's very interesting because sometimes you feel alone. You know, being vegan and everybody else is eating all this stuff and you're, you're by yourself. So I was really happy to come up here and see that other people 
are as interested in health as I am. You need to have support because the, the entire society is against change as far as a dietary change because people are very entrenched and uh, in order for people to make change they need support they need encouragement changing my cooking style from um, to a more plant-based diet is definitely a learning curve I think it takes at least 21 days just to mentally embrace I can physically live like this <laughs> and then after that after that then you're more relaxed and and your mind can um, entertain more recipes and it doesn't seem so overwhelming. People tell me often that the reason they can't adopt a healthy diet or a plant-based diet is they don't have enough time and they don't have enough money. Well those are excuses because the reality is is we all have the same 24 hours a day and so that's an excuse right there and if you get a pressure cooker if you do simpler recipes you have just as much time to make a vegetable stew as you do a beef stew so I don't buy the time excuse everybody's busy you end up finding those five to seven wonderful recipes that you know are winners every time and you just rotate those or or serve them with a twist and then every now and then you you end up with too many sweet potatoes and you have to find so many so many special recipes to to cook sweet potatoes a different way and it's been a fun. It's been a joy. As far as money is concerned, when you eat a whole food plant-based diet and you buy things in bulk, like lentils or split peas or beans, at least where I live in Los Angeles, I can get them for 49 cents a pound. It's practically free. If you go to the Forks Over Knives website or Dr. McDougall's website, they've done research where they've proven you can eat for as little as something like three dollars a day if you eat whole plant food. My husband and I noticed that the change from a plant-based diet, from, from a meat-eating diet to a plant-based diet, that it's in your mind. You know, the battle is in your mind. That it is, we used to say to ourselves, oh, we can't eat meat. Oh, oh mine was cheese. Oh, I cannot live without cheese. And it was so amazing to realize, oh yeah, you can. To maintain this new lifestyle, Amanda understood it was important to create a shopping regime that could be easily followed. During the grocery tour, it's sort of a little bit of everything. We have a, a few handouts that we give that explain about label reading, and we teach them how to read labels and what to look for, because you can do it in an instant if you know what to look for. If you buy smoked or roasted spices, the flavor is exponentially so much better. Better. We teach them that and then we also go down every single aisle and we pick up and show them the best products and also we show them some of the deceptions and labeling and so forth and so we teach them what to look out for that's dishonest and we teach them products that they might not even be aware of that they can fill their pantry up with to have good food on hand. Many people are concerned about the fat and cholesterol in beef or pork so they're looking for something healthier. They might switch to chicken or perhaps to fish. And I can understand why they would try to make that choice. However, when we look at the results, it doesn't turn out to help very much. Chicken is almost as high in fat and almost as high in cholesterol as beef is. And with fish, sometimes it's even higher in fat. Now, people will say, but it's, it's good fat in fish. Here's the bad news. If I have a, a salmon or other fish, 70 to 85 percent of the fat in that fish is not good fat. It's not those healthy omega-3s that people are looking for. If I have a salmon filet, it has about 12 grams of fat. Less than two grams are good fat. The other 10 plus grams are just there to increase your waistline. And when we look at, at fish eaters, their risk of diabetes is considerably higher compared to people who don't eat fish at all. As the people of Marshall began to embrace the new diet, the town's restaurants soon followed, as owners saw the growing demand for plant-based menus. Five years ago, there were no restaurants that served what we call vegan. We had no restaurants that even had an idea, inkling of what that concept was. And uh, when we had our first event here in town where we brought and you know various clinicians and the speakers that we talked about, we realized that one, we've got to have somewhere for people to eat that's healthy when they come to, the, to our community here. And number two, if people want to make this change in their life and they can't always eat at home or prepare foods at home uh, that are work, you know, and are on the go during the day and that kind of thing, 
they need somewhere that they can find, you know, support. Our first experience with vegans was when we were catering a trial group that came, I believe, from New York and they said they had several vegans on their team. And at that point, Deb was scrambling online to find out, first of all, what it was, right. and second of all, how to prepare foods right. that were acceptable, because it's easy to shortcut. We helped educate them. We gave them uh, resources of uh, recipes and books the, from uh, chefs and, and on how to prepare these kinds of foods and what kind of dishes are out there that they can prepare so they could find the right mix for their restaurant and that kind of thing. A lot of the rep restaurants were very skeptical at first, and they didn't think it would be really great for their business, but some of them it turned out to be amazing and they've had some of them record-breaking weekends, record-breaking sales days, and more restaurants are eager to get involved. And I don't think it's just because of the money, too. I think they're excited about what this does for the community because it brings a lot of people into town and gets Marshall a lot of attention. So I think they want to be involved because it's an exciting thing for Marshall. So now we've got uh, approximately uh, seven, seven to eight restaurants now in our town that, that have uh, whole foods, plant-based, vegan type option on their menu. And in some cases, they have a whole separate menu of, of uh, numerous vegan options and choices. And every time there's an event here, the, the other day we did an event over at Wiley College. Every time we have an event like that and, and people speak about the positive effects of a vegan diet, our numbers always increase on our black bean burgers and our veggie burgers and our and our vegan sandwiches and it did this week we had several people from the college come as we began to uh, have these seminars bring people in here people became uh, educated and began to understand you know what this meant and how it affects people's lives and how it can transform people's lives so the human breast milk of the mother underscores the importance of the amount of protein we need. So we don't need huge amounts of protein, and we certainly don't need the wrong amount of protein. So yes, not only do we not need to eat animal protein foods, but we need not to eat animal protein foods to be healthy. Today, Dr. Montgomery uh, revealed some very startling facts and statistics. And you know, one thing that I've learned, I've been in the financial industry for years, and I learned you cannot argue with numbers. You know, the law of large numbers always works. It always proves out to be true. You can argue, but it doesn't do any good. I've known for years, I mean, you know, knowing something and not doing it doesn't do you any good. You know, a lot of people say that knowledge is power. That's not true. Knowledge applied is power. I've had the knowledge for years, but honestly, it's just been a, uh, a, a, an extreme gut check for me today uh, uh, to really you know, realize that it's not just knowing the truth, it's not just you know, hearing the facts, but, but you know, I've got to apply it. You know, and it's up to me to do that. You know, a lot of times we try to blame all of our circumstances. You know, well, I grew up with this, I grew up with that. Those are things that affect us, but quite honestly, I'm a big boy. I'm 50 years old now. You know, and it's my choice. Uh, on October the 20th, 2013, last year, uh, I dropped dead from sudden coronary failure. My heart just failed and stopped. Uh, I was dead for six minutes. Uh, the last thing I remember is I had an increased heart rate. My heart rate was somewhere in the the neighborhood of about 196 beats a minute and my wife said honey we need to go to the hospital we need to go to the emergency room I said let me go to the restroom I was trying to come out of the restroom when I hit the floor and the last thing I know is is I called out her name well uh, at that time of course she called 911 uh, they responded within six minutes, thank goodness, because I was literally dead for six minutes. Um, they had to hit me with uh, the defibrillator four different times to bring me back to life. My wife has tried to hold me accountable for years. And honestly, through all of her efforts, God bless her for it, uh, neither one of us have stuck with a plant-based diet, and we know that it's the only true solution to this but you know I'm just I'm very I'm, I'm full of hope I'm, I'm very uh, excited honestly you know about what I heard today and the facts that I saw because you can't argue with the facts you know I don't want to repeat myself but that's that's just a fact you cannot argue with the facts they are what they are the statistics are what they are
Hearing top experts back up Ed and Amanda's philosophy with hard facts has helped convince even the skeptics in the Marshall community that their healthier lifestyle choices were based on science, not romantic notions. Fortunately, I was able to come back. I've got another chance. And I don't believe God spared me for no reason. I believe there was a reason for me to come back. And maybe this is my chance, you know, to, to do something different. A whole food, plant-based diet doesn't just work hard at preventing illness. It's also about enhancing performance for athletes looking to compete at the highest levels. It lodged this question in my mind, which is, if I could, if I could, if I had so many years of abusing myself with drugs and alcohol and horrible eating habits and a sedentary lifestyle and an overstressed professional life, uh, and in such a short period of time feel so good, and be performing athletically things that I didn't think that I was capable of, what am I capable of? Well, the whole food plant-based diet we've learned is very useful for just creating general health and preventing a lot of problems, a lot of diseases. Very broad-based idea. And we know in a lot of cases, some really fundamental biochemical explanations for why this is true. And because the breadth is so, is so wide, it's so many different conditions, it also influences our physical activity. I have a few theories about why plant-based diets work better for athletes and, and why athletes who try them do do better. And one is that plant-based diets are very high in carbohydrates, or they're, they're higher than most other diets in carbohydrate. And if you know anything about physical endurance and physical activity, the most important thing you need to do is make sure you get enough carbohydrates. So in a society now where a lot of people are running away from carbohydrates, that's actually going to be detrimental to their efforts to have a more physically fit lifestyle, but if, if you're eating a plant-based diet, you're going for those carbs, you're eating those beans, those grains, fruits and vegetables, and therefore you're fueling the ideal athlete's diet. I'm Tim Sheaf. I was born in Connecticut, America. I grew up in England. I live in London. I was born in 88 and I'm a professional freerunner. Freerunning to me is like when you're a child and they build you playgrounds and you go into a playground and you're on the swings and then you get bored of just swinging on them and you start to climb. And as children we call that play and as an adult you outgrow the playground and you start to, you know, walking around streets and instead of just walking down the pathways that, that is meant for you to walk down, you start going a different way and having a different swing on the whole thing. So freerunning for me is just play in an adult form. It's like a archaic revival of human body, but with this new modern environment that we were in. I've never been anywhere near as good an athlete as when I became vegan and started to understand nutrition. I've not been to the doctors in like four years, five years, because I, I learned my body, I really understand it. So what happened was, uh, of course, this question is festering in my mind, like, what am I capable of? Well, in order to answer that question, I needed a challenge. I needed something extraordinary, something that scared me to death in order to really test this, you know, this question of what am I capable of? And I discovered this race that I'd never heard of. It's called Ultraman. This is a very heart healthy diet. And you're not going to get away with being an athlete if you do not have a healthy heart, not for very long anyway. So this diet helps with blood viscosity, meaning your blood's not going to be thick and um, um, too, too viscous to where you can't perform well. Your blood pressure's going to be lower and more ideal for athletic performance. Most people have heard of an Ironman, which is a very long triathlon. Over the course of one day, an Ironman uh, triathlon is a 2.4 mile swim, 
a 112 mile bike followed by a marathon all in one day. It's long, it's crazy. And I was thinking about doing that. And then I discovered this race called Ultraman, which is twice that distance. It's a three day double Ironman distance triathlon, 320 miles, where over a three day period, you circumnavigate the entire big island of Hawaii. I think vegans or people who follow plant-based diets are just typically more health conscious. They're very aware of the foods they're eating and the types of foods they're eating. So they're gonna go for the most nutritious foods, which will ultimately help fuel um, um, and, uh, performance, but also help with recovery because you're consuming more antioxidants, more phytochemicals, more nutrients that benefit recovery and benefit your, your health in general. My knees stopped hurting in the winters after I changed my diet, that's a sign for me. My energy went up, I got more energy. My recovery rate improved so much I can train every day sometimes and not feel achy the next day at all. At the same time, my perspective on nutrition started to evolve because I felt so good eating a plant-based diet, I couldn't deny that. But in the back of my mind, I was still thinking, well, where am I getting my protein? Like, am I crazy? Because every time I would share like, oh, I'm eating a plant-based diet and I'm training for this crazy race, people would look at me like I was an insane person. Well, where are you getting your protein? You're gonna harm yourself. I didn't concern myself with nutrition that much before. So when I made the change, I actually learned a lot more about nutrition than I, than I ever had the knowledge of. And some of the high impact stuff I do, it's amazing. Most athletes wouldn't think they need all these protein powders and that, you know, you realize it's all propaganda. I do see a lot of athletes who are misinformed or maybe they've misread something about um, needing more protein and somehow uh, animal-based proteins like whey proteins are going to be better for them or, or more efficient. And the truth is, A, you could do this probably with your diet. Most people who exercise, if you're not at, an, at a professional level, don't need to supplement with any protein. We get more than enough protein in our diets. If we get enough calories, we get enough protein. So supplementing with anything is not necessary. And what has happened over the years is that athletes have become very accustomed, you know, to use animal protein-based supplements, obviously, because they think it makes muscle. And from the science point of view, it does. And we know that. You know, take, take these protein supplements, they build more muscle. But, uh, and so they, they, you could see the muscle is very visible. And this is probably pretty good for some, from the, some of the people in sports like football because they have more weight, more muscle, maybe push around, but it's coming at a cost. Supplementing with something like an animal-based protein, such as whey, is actually somewhat detrimental to your health. This is very taxing to your kidneys, taxing to your blood. It's not going to lead um, to an overall better diet and better health. You might be able to get away with it for a while, and especially if your goal is just to get bigger and not necessarily healthier or faster, um, then you may see results there. But again, it's at a cost to, to your internal organs and I wouldn't recommend it. They're also killing their bodies. And so if they keep on doing that, they get cancer, heart disease, stroke and so forth, you know, when they finish the sport. The average age of death among these professional football players who do this mostly, the average age of death is about 56 or 57 years. So they pay a huge price. When you don't eat dead animals and you feel this good, there is absolutely no reason on the planet to eat dead animals. <laughs> Feeling good is what this Californian sanctuary majors in, providing shelter for over 100 rescued farm animals. It offers tours to meet them and learn about the healthy alternatives. They do have very different personalities. You know, some of them are gonna, just like any of our dogs or cats, you know. Um, he loves showing people how much he loves them by giving them all the kisses in the world. Whereas some of the others aren't gonna give you kisses like this. <laughs> We're here at Farm Sanctuary near Los Angeles where we rescue and care for animals who've been rescued from factory farm cruelty. And at Farm Sanctuary we model a different kind of relationship with these animals where they're our friends, not our food. Uh, farm Sanctuary is a place where vegan is normal and the animals get to be who they are. He's, uh, his back legs, I want to say he's between 6'2 six, six and 6'4. Um, so he's a, 
He's a very big boy. It's not in our interest to eat food that makes us sick or to support an agricultural industry that's destroying the planet. But sadly, many people unwittingly support that industry by continuing with the habits that, that they've grown up with of eating meat and dairy and eggs. I play music for them sometimes and um, he was very curious as to what a guitar was. Oh, thank you. The farming industry has changed drastically in recent years. Small family farms have been replaced by these large factory farms, and they're commonly referred to as CAFOs, or confined animal feeding operations. And that is now the norm, where you have animals raised by the thousands in warehouses where they never go outside, they're never able to feel the sun on their back, they're never able to walk in the grass. Uh, they live in cages their whole lives. The vast majority of antibiotics that are used in the U.S. are actually used in the farming industry. So this is resulting in the development of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which not only threatens the well-being of animals, but it also threatens human health. We also have emerging pathogens, things like mad cow disease, that result when you feed dead animals to living animals, and that is still happening. You have diseases like avian influenza that are common on farms in the U.S., and um, you have diseases like Yoni's disease, which the human counterpart to that is Crohn's disease, which is common on dairy farms in the U.S. So you have a variety of problems that exist and you have new diseases like this uh, porcine epidemic that's recently uh, affected pig farms that are developing in these factory farms. It's a perfect breeding ground for disease. So this is an industry that kills animals. We consume the animals and then in some sort of strange twist of karma perhaps, we die of heart disease and cancers and ailments that could be prevented. Each of us every day makes choices that have profound impacts on our own health. We literally are what we eat. And if we eat animals who've been abused and who are stressed and who are diseased, that has an impact. I think all the ethical reasons for being a vegan or vegetarian are solid, but some people really don't care about that and they just want to get healthy and we don't want them to feel like they're going to be judged or excluded. So anyone can come to something that's about health but not everyone can embrace something that's about an ideology they might not share. The question concerning why this information is not better known is a really good question. But what's really interesting is that even in most of the ancient Greeks, they knew, some of them knew, they didn't have to eat animals. So they became vegetarians. Pythagoras, for example, is famous and people who ate that way were called Pythagoreans. Socrates and Plato and some others, they knew that, you know, you could be really fit and healthy if you did not eat meat. The big food companies, the giant food conglomerates, uh, buttressed by very powerful special interest groups, well-funded and very politically connected, have done a fantastic job of convincing the American public that we need certain foods just to breathe in and out, let alone perform as an athlete. The forces that want to deny this are very, very powerful. Because I'm questioning, why do we rely on drugs, you know, to get our health? Why do we eat the food that we ought not to be eating to make us sick, especially our children? You know, why do we make these really dumb decisions? But there's big industries. They don't want me saying that kind of thing, that's silly. Historically, the Department of Agriculture in the United States has played a big role in trying to promote agricultural product. That's part of their job. So they tell Americans to eat meat, eat cheese, eat sugar, eat all kinds of things that are made in America. When you think about it, in America, the nutritional guidelines that all students learn and have to follow, federal employees, the um, uh, prisoners in the jail, it's made up by the Agriculture Department. Why is the Agriculture Department making nutritional guidelines at all? They're there to sell meat and dairy products, the Ag, the ag Department. The nutritional guidelines should be made up by the doctors, by the Health and Human Services Department, and NIH, not from the Agriculture Department. Here in Marshall, uh, it's something that we're uh, trying to focus on now, a, a way to approach our school system and try to find a way to work with them to improve the, the school lunch program here. It's, uh, it's a little difficult from the standpoint that uh, 
a lot of that is originates, it's what they do through uh, the state level in Austin. The uh, Texas Department of Agriculture here in Texas oversees the school lunch program. If you go to any public school, you'll see posters that uh, advertise milk, got milk, with pictures of strapping young men doing bench presses. And even if you're not focusing on these images, they're pervasive, they're everywhere, and they work on your subconscious. We're fighting a little bit of a Madison Avenue war, and the other side has more bucks than the broccoli growers and the, uh, and, and the uh, kale growers. We have lifetimes, lifetimes of seeing these images, of being told milk does a body good, or if you want you know, strong bones, you've got to drink milk, or if you want to build muscle, then you need animal protein. And it's simply not true. The meat and dairy industries have been relentless in loading up the medical literature with, with suggestive studies that, oh, this fat isn't quite so bad and, uh, and it's, it's not quite sure if uh, animal protein causes this. Um, and so stay with those basic food groups, get that meat on every plate here. Now, unfortunately, the farmers are happy because they're getting big subsidies and the drug industry is happy too. But everybody else is paying a terrible price for this. So I'm convinced it will change. The kind of current vogue that uh, we got it all wrong and saturated fat is healthy, it's fine, don't worry, it's good for the heart, the cardiologists have been misled. That is the biggest bunch of bunk that has come along in the last five years and there's no question it's driven by big meat, big dairy, big farm. There's huge billions of dollars at stake here. In recent years we've seen a bit of a fad called the paleo diet and the idea is let's look back in time at the Paleolithic period and see what people used to eat. And they picked a time when people had developed stone tools, like hatchets and arrowheads, so they gained the ability to kill animals and eat meat, but before they figured out how to put seeds in the ground and grow plants. And so the idea is in that little band of history, after we were, could kill animals, but before we had agriculture, that must be the healthiest time. Well, if avoiding flour products means you're not eating so many cookies, maybe that's a good thing. But on the other hand, if it means you're avoiding healthy rice and, and healthy plant products and loading up on meat, you can gain weight, you can have a high cholesterol level, and your risk of a heart attack or diabetes or hypertension will go up. I like to look a little bit further back. Human beings biologically are related to the other great apes, chimpanzees and gorillas, for example. And they are not charging around in the forest with a hatchet trying to find an animal they can slaughter. They are eating foods they can pick with their hands, especially fruit. And they have uh, perhaps a model that might tell us a thing or two. For Ed and Amanda's journey, Marshall is a single step towards the education of thousands of towns. We're faced with a health care crisis here in this country, and it, it trickles right on down to our state and city level. Our city here in Marshall is located in this, what we call, as a, or what's been referred to as a stroke belt. And our health care costs here in our city, to our city government, is approximately a million dollars a year. Uh, that's substantial. It's a big hit in our operating budget, and it's indicative of the crisis we face all across this country and across the state of Texas. I think that is going to change, because we have a problem here in America childhood obesity. And one in three children will develop diabetes as an adult. We can't afford that anymore. What we've seen with uh, Whole Foods Corporation here is they've taken uh, a policy of uh, bringing uh, the idea and the concept of a Whole Foods uh, plant-based diet to their employees and even to their um, patrons uh, and exposing them to that concept and, uh, and in so doing they've been able to uh, lower their health care costs over the last uh, few years. They're in fact the only Fortune 500 company whose uh, health care costs have been on the decline in the last few years as opposed to increasing like everybody else across the country. So by encouraging their employees to adopt a whole foods plant-based diet, they've been able to uh, reverse their health care costs uh, in a meaningful way. And that, of course, that goes to the bottom line, not, not to speak of the benefits for the individual lives that it you know, improves. So that's uh, what we hope to do here. I hope that uh, we're able to uh, uh, see that kind of a trend in our own community. It's undeniable that Ed and Amanda's passion has helped the town of Marshall to not only improve the individual health of its citizens, but also the town standing on the map and its tourist trade. 
Sometimes it's real hard to get some of the, the firefighters involved, but you know, slowly but surely they're, they're starting to try it. And you see a lot of the firefighters are juicing and doing different things. They're actually eating healthier, whether it be juicing or actually just eating better, you know, leafy greens, uh, vegetables, fruits, and things of that nature. So they're buying into the concept and they're, they're, they're feeling better. They're working out, as you can see, they play basketball. They do all sorts of activities and such. And they're, you know, their, their stamina is getting better and more prepared for or what we do. We're trying to inspire people to eat healthier, but when we see their transformations, we're inspired. And Reggie certainly is a great example. Our former county judge and his wife have, uh, are, have made a transition and they've seen some tremendous health benefits in their lives. I was borderline diabetic and, my, and I asked my doctor, could I wait and not take medicine and see if the new diet would have an impact on it? When I went back to see the doctor, she was thrilled that I had lost weight and uh, my sugar had gone down where I don't have to take medicine. So for Ed and Amanda to bring this bright but warm light into this community is nothing but good. It's cracking and, it's, and, and the sand is wearing away under the foundation. The public is understanding. There's an old saying, you, you can't keep a hat pin in a cloth bag for very long, you know, and the point comes out. And this truth of this is coming out. The United States is the most prosperous country in the world, and yet we've never been more sick as a society. And that would give most people reason to be very negative or pessimistic about the future, but I'm very optimistic. I'm very inspired by the kinds of things happening all over the U.S. and around the world where people are becoming aware of our broken food system and they want to create change. This plant-based movement has really taken a foothold and I've seen countless people change their lives completely in very short periods of time, repairing their health wholesale by just getting back to the root, by getting back to eating whole plant-based foods close to their natural state. Human beings are social animals, so if everybody is doing something, we tend to do it and accept that it's just the normal way of being. But as, other, as people start doing something in a new way, and if these people are healthy and happy, other people are curious and interested in being healthy and happy and are more likely to try it and become interested in living that way. And in places like Marshall, Texas, you have the mayor who's pushing for a healthy plant-based city and it's a great thing to see. I think the most rewarding thing is when someone we don't even know comes up to us and says I want to tell you what happened to me because of Get Healthy Marshall and what you're doing. I went on a plant-based diet and my life has changed. I love that. And I'm seeing this movement blossom everywhere I go. People excited because they're looking for real, sustainable, long-term solutions to their diet and their health. And because of this internet age, our bullshit meters, our, our detectors are very well refined. We know when we're being marketed to, we know when we're being lied to, and we know the truth. And the one thing about eating plant-based is, there's nothing to hide. It's just the truth. Hopefully in 10 years, people will look at the meat and dairy industry as the, in the same way that they look at the tobacco industry today and they'll be able to make that recognition that this is not a healthy way to go. For Ed and Amanda, they know it'll always be hard yards, changing perceptions, and a state famed for its award-winning beef. But the mayor and his wife are committed to the long haul. They're looking forward to the day when a whole food, plant-based diet is seen as not some vegan curio, but as the only option for optimum health and, for every U.S. citizen, a longer, happier life. That's their American dream. It's kind of interesting. As a side note, it's become the largest tourism event in our community. So it's, it's uh, gotten a lot of attention just in and of itself for that reason. We but, really started for Marshall people too, so we didn't expect that it would become a tourism event. We were hoping local people would really embrace it. And, and some have, but people from outside the community Surprisingly, to us, started traveling to little Marshall, Texas to come to this thing. So we're, we're glad to have the visitors. It's been like an explosion of other towns and communities that have people that have attended our event have gone back home and uh, wanted to replicate what we're doing in their own communities on some way or another. 
and uh, it's been really um, surprising to see how many there are. There's 10 on Facebook and there's another one, Get Healthy Baytown, that has a website and they're doing monthly potlucks. To really change the world, the, the plant-based movement needs to be a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening around the state of Texas, around the, around the United States now, it's amazing. And not just here, but uh, in Europe also. So we're, we're excited to see all the new changes and new awareness that's coming about.